So, uh, this is a study into um, uh, anomalous experiences of people who have epilepsy, specifically temporal lobe epilepsy. And um, we, we know from the literature, there's a very well-established body of literature that ranges right the way back to the Neo-Babylonians. We know that there are individuals who have epilepsy, who have um, experiences, they have seizures, which they have described in the neuropsychiatric literature as either ecstatic or numinous or cosmic. Um, but unfortunately, the literature is um, very quantitative. So it tends to be the case that we've got lots of predefined explanations of these experiences, which sound very much like other um, parapsychological experiences that people describe in non-epileptic populations. Um, in the medical model, so when we look at the neuropsychiatric literature, we have um, a few case studies, and um, individuals who talk about the experiences that they've had um, are regarded as having symptoms of um, their epilepsy. So the, the kindest individuals would regard these as hallucinations. Um, the uh, perhaps less kind would regard them as um, delusions. And there is actually something in the DSM called temporal lobe personality disorder. If, if uh, an individual with epilepsy goes to their psychiatrist or their neurologist and um, describes um, numinous, ecstatic, near-death, out-of-body experiences, they are ordinarily regarded as um, being psychotic. And um, the suggestion of the uh, professional body is that um, these are things that people don't want and that they should be medicated away. And um, so I was having a look into this. Um, the aims of this piece of research, this second study, was to get really get in deep with people's experience, so to focus on the phenomenological element and to provide a perspective which steps away from um, stigmatisation. So the idea was to step away very definitely from a quantitative study which predefined in questions what somebody's experience was and to put an individual's experience first to gain a, a deeper understanding of, of this experience. And I use something called interpretative phenomenological analysis that I was really hoping that Erica would explain to you so I didn't have to, but here goes. <laughs> so it's, it's a qualitative methodology and it, it focuses on phenomenology. It focuses on lived experience. And um, because of that, it takes a very ideographic uh, approach, which means that what, uh, it wants to give the voice of each individual a lot of space to give a really deep understanding of the lived experience of what's being looked at. Because of that, there are very small participant numbers. So normally for a master's thesis, it's recommended that between three and six people are interviewed. I interviewed nine. An average for a PhD thesis that's just IPA would be about 10. So we're not talking about big numbers here, but we're talking about very, very deep data. And um, it's characterized by this uh, double hermeneutic, which is that the uh, participant is making sense of their experience, and the researcher is making sense of the participant making sense of their experience. And that's the interpretative element to it. So there is an element of the researcher stepping back and interpreting what the um, participant is saying. So I had five, uh, nine participants, five females, four, four males, um, and uh, I was actually really surprised that I had to start turning people away. So I anticipated that I would um, have a terrible problem getting participants. Because if you imagine, um, epilepsy is our most common neurological disorder. About 4% of any population across the world has it. And temporal lobe epilepsy is... Um, one condition within the range of these conditions. And individuals, I thought, who had these cosmic or, 
or uh, numinous experiences were then another subset of that group. So I, I kind of thought I was going to be really struggling, but actually I really had to start turning people away. So I, I stopped it at nine. And there's a, a very wide age range, as you can see. Um, uh, the ages um, at interview were, were, I think, probably um, sort of, of individuals who had started to process their experience. Um, and most people had uh, developed their epilepsy much younger in their life. So um, a lot of them didn't take medication. So in this day of um, people talking about CBD oil, I was reading some of the transcripts again the other day, and I was really uh, quite surprised to see that a lot of my um, participants had actually used CBD oil to control their epilepsy. That's just nothing. Uh, so this is where I am at the moment. It's work in progress, but these are the sort of themes overall that seem to be coming up. Um, every single participant talked about um, experiencing going through or stepping through a portal to an alternate reality. And the descriptions people use, words like portal, sound a lot like um, some of the descriptions I've heard of um, shamanic practitioners, where people talk about popping. Um, some of the experiences that people talk about lucid dreaming, again, similar kind of language. Um, the mystical, the range of mystical experiences that people have are really broad. So individuals have near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences. They talk about um, seeing... Um, uh, energy fields, they talk about lights in the room, they talk about uh, other presences or other people. Two of the participants were mediums and they talked about um, their epilepsy um, opening the door to um, their, their contact with the spirit world. Um, and uh, almost all of the participants talked about um, accessing a download of wisdom, uh, a, a type of knowledge, <coughs> that there was no possible way that they could have possibly had from anywhere else. So it's a, a sort of a, a download of information. There was something very key about this being an embodied type of knowledge. So this wasn't something that was um, just in the mind. This was something that people felt and held in their bodies. Um, and um, it's something that they have all learned not to tell other people. Um, some of the quotes that people uh, were using were, well, I wouldn't tell my, um, my neurologist, he would think I was mad. Um, one of my participants said, you're the only person I've ever told this to. I've never told my wife. I haven't told anybody. Um, one of the participants uh, t was told, don't tell anybody about this. You'll never have a partner. You'll never get a job. You'll never have a life. <laughs> so these are parapsychological anomalous experiences that people are really learning to shut down. But um, it, I suppose very much in, in kin with the other two presentations that we've had this morning. Um, I'm sorry, we have to stop for okay. questions. Okay. Individuals think it's really about their selfhood. So it's about who they are. And I'll stop then because you can see the last one, which is life as a spiritual journey. If, you, if you'd like to just finish, if you like, and then there can just be just a few few questions to finish the last one. Okay. okay. Uh, so uh, uh, the sixth group I've got at the moment is that people um, uh, developed their sense of self around these experiences. So they've had these experiences of meeting God, of knowing how the universe works, of being outside their body. And it's developed their sense of who they are and what their life trajectory is. Um, and that has meant that they have all, bar one, regarded their life as a spiritual journey. So their meaning making has become around it being something profoundly transformative, but also very spiritual in nature. And I, that's, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Thank you.